Okay, so we're going to conclude our presentation. This will probably be the longest video. Um, we're going to start with CRISPR. It segues very nicely into all of the ethical considerations in genomic medicine. We're going to talk about financial and legal applications or um, implications um, that nurses need to be aware of. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It is a mouthful. I do not expect you to memorize it. It is a technology that can be used to selectively modify the DNA of living organisms. It's being used in humans. It's being used in other species. It was developed after observations in bacteria. They have naturally occurring CRISPR molecules, and I'll explain that. So the CRISPR um, system in a bacteria is sort of like a vaccination. Um, it gives them the memory of a virus that's tried to attack them, and that RNA molecule that recognizes the virus's DNA then prompts a protein. It cues up this protein called Cas9 that cuts it with a pair of scissors. There goes your virus. Virus can't infect you. Um, it was originally developed by people who made yogurt and other fermented foods. They wanted cultures that were live and active. They did not want milk that did not turn into yogurt. And so they patented this CRISPR technology, or they used this CRISPR technology to make sure that all of the bacteria had it. Um, so the guide takes an enzyme to a piece of DNA that you want to edit. When we're using CRISPR technology in other species, um, we, not we, I mean, I don't do this, but other scientists um, will take an RNA molecule that matches a sequence um, on a strand of DNA. So it's those bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, right? Only in RNA, the thymine is replaced by uracil. That's not important to know right now. At some point it will be. But we take that little piece of RNA and it scans, walks along the little chromosomes and finds that one sequence. Cas9 comes in, cuts that strand. And then it can be repaired in a number of ways. Either you can just reattach um, the two strands of DNA where you cut off that gene or you can use another piece on another chromosome to sort of make up the difference. It copies the information, so you still have two complete chromosomes. Anyway, at present, the technology is still developing, but it shows promise. I'm going to give you a good example of that using sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. So there was a clinical trial started in 2019. Um, Patients have seen remarkable improvements. It's like they've been cured. If you were to take a blood smear of patients treated with this CRISPR technology, um, they no longer have the sickle-shaped cells or any cells that look like beta thalassemia after their genes were manipulated. So Victoria Gray was one patient. She's given interviews. Janelle Stevenson is another. If you want to look her up, she's on 20 Minutes. There's a YouTube clip of her. Um, they were living with debilitating sickle cell anemia. They say they can't even, they couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs. If you've ever seen sickle cell anemia in the clinical setting, it is devastating. People are in and out of the hospital. They become tolerant to opioids, so nothing relieves their pain. They need multiple transfusions, which causes problems of its own. They have a lifespan of about 30 to 40 years old. Many, many complications of sickle cell anemia shorten the lifespan and decrease its quality. It is nothing but suffering for people with sickle cell anemia. Anyway, Victoria Gray received this treatment, and she's been asymptomatic for two and a half years. There have been other cases of successful treatment, and the trial is ongoing. Now, it remains to be seen whether Victoria Gray and her cohort um, develop any complications from CRISPR. There have been other genetic medicine breakthroughs that were thought to be very um, extraordinary and they resulted in unintended consequences. Maybe a gene was um, put in the wrong place and the, there's one trial I know of where children were cured of a metabolic disease and four or five years later, they all started to succumb to leukemia. So it does need to be followed. It is still in the trial phases. Developments in the treatment for HIV and other diseases are underway. It does seem to be easier to treat diseases in the blood and the um, bone marrow because it's easier to deliver the technology that way. But researchers are working on treatments for dementia, like Alzheimer's. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? Parkinson's disease, cancer, diabetes. There are all sorts of um, lines of research that are trying to address human illness with CRISPR.
So as a nurse, you will encounter this at some point in your future, unless something newer and better comes along or something halts the development of CRISPR. Um, there are ethical considerations you need to be aware of. Gene editing of human embryonic cells in, in particular seems to be a thing that bioethicists are debating hotly. There's this fear of creating designer babies. If you go back to Genomics Goes to the Movies, the very first thing I did with you guys in class, saw the movie clip from Gattaca. Um, if you were to watch that movie, you would see how they sat down and created their second child um, to create, yeah, this is a baby, it's still you, but it's the best of you because we took out all the things that might cause illness or you know devastation. Well, different people have different ideas of what desirable traits are. I mean, for most of us, I think we're agreeable to the fact that a human being who can live up to the World Health Organization's uh, definition of health is what we want. We want them to be free of suffering and disease. That's kind of the goal that we all look for, but other people might think other things are important. So in that documentary, Human Nature, that's posted in your module, and I do hope you watch it, um, there is a scientist who works on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, another sticky issue. Um, and he says that people came up to him. Athletic coaches wanted to know if you could use this technology to make people stronger and faster. Um, trophy wives wanted to know, wouldn't you make all your kids taller and blonder? And, you know, I mean, it was kind of like different things are important to different people. Um, and there's this fear that we could do this very unethically and sort of continue in the line of Adolf Hitler. And in fact, that was one of Jennifer Doudna, um, the lead researcher at Berkeley, who sort of got the Nobel Prize for um, CRISPR-based technology. It was like her recurring nightmare that she was there to discuss Cas9 and Adolf Hitler turns around in his chair and he's all ears, you know. Um, there are other et ethical issues that come up when you're editing embryonic germ cells. Remember, that's going to affect every cell in the human being's body. Um, editing the genome on human embryonic cells gives issue, you know, gives rise to issues of informed consent. So in other words, maybe my parents wanted me to be free of eczema and um, they wanted me to be immune to the chicken pox and somebody edited my genome, but now I have a translocation on the Philadelphia, you know, I have that Philadelphia translocation and I get leukemia at the age of eight. I didn't give consent for that. I didn't tell anybody to alter my DNA. Maybe I would have been better off with eczema. Um, so there is that potential, those unintended consequences of embryonic gene editing. In those trials that I mentioned for sickle cell anemia, it's important to note that only the somatic cells were involved. Um, so let's say that Janelle Stevenson or Victoria Gray have a baby, they still have the possibility, you know, none of their germ cells were edited. They still have the possibility of passing on that trait. Um, a hundred percent of their children will get a trait from them. And if they marry somebody who also carries it, that risk, you know, you remember the Punnett squares. So I'm not going to go into that. But embryonic cells seem to be the real hotbed for debate, not so much the somatic cells. Editing the genes of other species could lead to unintentional impact on the environment. And we're going to talk about that in a case when we discuss intergenerational and racial justice with mosquitoes. But plants have been edited um, for drought resistance, things like that. We just don't know what the impact is on the environment and what seven generations from now we'll have to live with based on decisions we make today. Um, and lastly, equitable access with everything. Um, CRISPR-based therapies could be revolutionary, but if they're only accessible to that 1% of the population that has the resources to acquire them, um, we've created an even bigger disparity for our vulnerable populations. And with that having been said, we're going to move forward into, sorry, let me back up, ethical, legal, and financial considerations of genomics. So the things that we're going to talk about, there are opportunities to misapply genomic research 
meaning that we use it for the wrong things, and there are opportunities to misinterpret what genomic researchers tell us. Um, and that kind of falls under the whole genetic discrimination um, umbrella. So we'll kind of get started with that. Genetic discrimination, it is happening. It has already happened. There have been cases in the US court system, including this one. A young boy was diagnosed with fragile X syndrome. It is genetically acquired from mother to son. It's like caused by a certain number of repeats on the X chromosome. It's a condition marked by intellectual disability. Some of these individuals will fall on the autism spectrum. Some will have characteristics of ADHD. They have usually large ears, pointy chins, um, low muscle tone, a few other things. They get recurrent ear infections and sinus infections. Family's insurance car carrier dropped him when he was 11 years old from coverage and then did not want to pay for any of the coverage they had already provided, stating that Fragile X was a pre-existing condition. It occurred prenatally. Therefore, when he enrolled within 30 days of birth, he is not covered. That is grossly unethical. I think most people can imagine how an insurance company could take that and apply it to almost everybody in the United States. Almost all of us carry a trait for some kind of disease. That's just the human condition at this point in time. So imagine if they say, you have the BRCA gene, we're dropping you. That's a pre-existing condition. You were born with the BRCA gene. Um, <clears throat> What if they say you have a genetic propensity towards diabetes? We're not covering you. Um, it's just not ethical. And the courts have held that this boy had a right to coverage. In another case, a social worker was fired from her job after confiding in a colleague that her mother had Huntington's disease and she had a 50% chance of developing the condition. Wow, be careful who you talk to at work. That is also grossly, grossly unethical. This was a person being fired from her job on her risk for a genetic disorder based on, oh, maybe she'll get it and she won't be productive and we'll have to pay out higher costs to her when she becomes symptomatic, if she becomes symptomatic. Um, there is legislation on the next slide. I go into it. Um, it is not comprehensive and it needs to be revisited. Um, and I song that organization I referenced in the first presentation is doing that. Um, but before we move on to the next topic, let's consider that case of athletes required by the NCAA to test for sickle cell trait. You remember I presented a case study on James. James was playing football for a division one school. He was required to test for sickle cell trait. Now, it's kind of interesting because the military <clears throat> actually was the first to discover that sickle cell trait was associated with this sudden death from overexertion in hot temperatures. And their response was to modify their training for every new recruit. They didn't want to discriminate. They didn't want to have two training protocols and they didn't want to just test everybody. That's costly. And it discriminates unfairly really to their African-American recruits because that population has a higher incidence. And the military is not trying to exclude people with, you know, for any reason, if they're willing and able to serve, if they're healthy. They found that the best solution was to just modify training so that people were hydrated and they didn't train as hard in hot weather and that they knew the signs and symptoms of that um, rhabdomyolysis that happens with sickling. The exceptional sickling, it's called. Now, the NCAA, on the other hand, said, let's test everyone for the sickle cell trait. And if they have sickle cell trait, then we modify the training. <coughs> and they did come up with the provision that you couldn't be banned from participation in sports. But think about implicit bias. Think about a coach who maybe doesn't play somebody as frequently or when the big scouts are watching based on that sickle cell trait, maybe today's a hot day, but you know, some NFL coach or NFL talent scouts out there, if you get played less in that situation, your chances for being scouted are a lot lower. Is this in fact a way to discriminate against African-American athletes? It's just a case for consideration and it certainly indicates the need for more regulation of what we do with the information we find. Otherwise, people aren't gonna go for genetic testing. We're never gonna advance 
genomic medicine if people are afraid to know what their risk is. Anyway, GINA legislation. GINA stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and that is a fact sheet. I can provide a link to it if you like it. <coughs> prohibits discrimination in employment practices based on genetic information. It's not comprehensive. So what it says is group insurance plans can't adjust premiums or deny coverage based on solely genetic information. Therefore, if you have the BRCA gene mutation that increases your risk for cancer, they cannot deny you coverage. They cannot make you pay more for the coverage you get. <coughs> Now, if you already have breast cancer and you're BRCA positive, they can call that a pre-existing condition. Um, that's called a manifest condition. It prohibits mandatory testing for genetic disorders um, so that you can't base decisions um, about coverage or employment. It extends HIPAA protections for genetic information, but it is not comprehensive. So, for example, you can acquire basic health and medical coverage through your employer if you have a genetic condition that's only found in testing, okay? <coughs> what you may not be able to do is enroll in voluntary wellness programs. It seems to me to be nonsense, uh, nonsensical in a way that you would exclude people with a genetic risk factor for a disease based on the fact that they have a risk for it. Um, but because there are financial incentives to quit smoking and whatever, I guess, um, and it's voluntary, employers have the right to exclude you from that coverage. It's weird, but true. It does not protect against genetic discrimination for life insurance. So if you have a genetic predisposition towards cancer, they can deny you coverage on that or they can make you pay more. <coughs> also true for long-term care insurance or disability insurance. So if you're found to have the gene that codes for early onset Alzheimer's, you have that allele, you can be turned down for long-term care insurance for disability insurance because those things incur a cost. It does not apply to people who receive health care through TRICARE, Veterans Affairs, and the Indian Health Service. Wow. So there's a lot of loopholes there for people who want to get around them. And remember that insurance companies are in the business of not paying claims. That is how they make their money. They charge you a premium. If they don't have to pay for anything, they win. So that is um, where we stand on genetic discrimination. Eugenics, bringing up this topic again. And that's where CRISPR kind of overlaps with this content. So the Human Genome Project has the potential to escalate practices associated with eugenics. If we can start coding for genes that, um, or we can start decoding which genes code for certain traits, we can decide which genes are desirable and which genes aren't. If we know where they are, we can target them for whatever reason. Formerly, the only thing that we could do was to limit the reproductive capacity of people that we considered undesirable. And I say we because collectively as a human race, this is our legacy. So the Nazis made this famous, right, um, in the concentration camps. But it happened in this country. I know I mentioned it before and I don't want to be repetitive, but it has happened as recently as the 1990s <coughs> with the Indian Health Service voluntarily, involuntarily, excuse me, involuntarily sterilizing women of native and indigenous descent based on social characteristics that were caused by a suboptimal environment, not because they were genetically inferior, but it was done. Um, so if you look at what CRISPR is able to do and what we can do with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, what we can do with prenatal testing, you could see that this could be misapplied. Um, and I think this is a really fertile debate for a lot of eugenicists. So we have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And if you have IVF in this country, the standard is that they will pretty much 
look at every embryo before they implant it to make sure that only the ones that are healthy survive. Well, right now, the only thing they can really see are gross abnormalities of the chromosomes. So any embryo that's not probably going to develop into a human being at all, is trisomy 15 or 8, is not going to be selected for implantation. If you have a known genetic disorder and they can identify where that gene is, they can also selectively exclude those embryos. So for example, Huntington's disease, um, uh, neurofibromatosis, those kind of things. We can selectively implant embryos that do not have those genetic traits. The issue gets stickier when we start looking at the whole concept of designer babies. And maybe I only want female embryos implanted. I don't want males. Well, there's an ethics involved in that and a gender balance um, issue. Gender balance is important for maintaining healthy societies. And yet in some countries, um, prenatal testing and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis have been used to favor males. Um, and we see a gender imbalance and that leads to all kinds of societal problems. Prenatal testing now has been expanded. We used to only have invasive methods like amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. They were done relatively late in pregnancy, still are. Um, and they were only offered to women over the age of 35 because there was a risk of miscarriage or preterm rupture of membranes leading to miscarriage. And that risk was about 1%, which is about the percentage that a woman 35 and over has of having an abnormal pregnancy. Well, now with non-invasive prenatal screening, we can actually sample a little fragment of fetal DNA. And at present, the only things we can really see would be trisomies like 13, 18, and 21. Um, it's usually, you know, you have to be somewhat further along in pregnancy. Those are the ones more likely to survive. You can see other trisomies if they're mosaic. Um, and you can see gender. So a lot of people are opting to have it done because it's more accurate than ultrasound. They can do their gender reveal a lot earlier. Um, again, you know, if you're selectively terminating on the basis of this test result, some people have expressed fears that as the technology evolves and gets more um, fine tuned so that we see things that are normal, but maybe less desirable to those parents that we will terminate pregnancies that don't have the desirable traits. And even with trisomy 21, the Down syndrome community, um, there are advocates for the Down syndrome community, including people who have it themselves, who are saying that this is genocide. There's nothing wrong with me. It was already bad when, you know, women over 35 were being tested. Now you're testing everybody. And what does that say to me that I have no right to live? So these are some things that really um, need to be looked at through people who have a strong ethical framework and compassionate eyes. Um, and hopefully that's all you nurse, nursing students who are gonna be out in practice in a year. Um, we have CRISPR, I've already talked a lot about CRISPR. It's the ability to directly edit the genes along the genome to create changes to DNA. That's the technology that I think scares people the most. Um, but eugenics is not a dead debate. It's not something that happened in the 1940s that we all hush up. It's something in the here and now that we need to know about. Now we get into the conflict. We have the duty to warn, meaning somebody who is not our patient is at risk versus the privacy of our patient's information. Now in other areas of healthcare, there's sort of a cut and dried aspect to this. Some things we do have a duty to warn, right? So in psychiatric medicine, if somebody expresses that they're going to hurt someone or that they are a danger to a child, we can warn that person. We do not have to respect their privacy. If somebody admits that they beat their children, we can go right to DCPP. Um, well, that's New Jersey, but you know, Child Protective Services. In fact, we are required to do so. In other areas of healthcare, like HIV, we are mandated to protect the patient's confidentiality. So rulings have already sort of been created with their certain areas of healthcare. But genomics <coughs> is one of those <coughs> newer areas of medicine where things are still evolving. Um, generally, the rights of a patient to have their medical information kept private overrules the right of another person to know that they're at risk. 
as a result of someone else's, else's health condition. It really has to be sort of an immediate and severe risk, right? But when we're talking about genetic information, the courts have sometimes cited differently. And this is where it's really, really tough to determine how this information gets used. And as nurses who are going into practice, it's going to be up to you to know what your liability is. And nobody's figured that out yet. So it behooves you to kind of be involved in this debate. We have the case of Pate versus Threlkel, where a physician was sued because he didn't warn his patient's daughter that she was at genetic risk for thyroid cancer. She later contracted thyroid cancer. Her father had it, chose not to disclose. The physician did not disclose. He was respecting his client's rights to um, privacy under HIPAA. But the Supreme Court of Florida sided with the daughter, saying that the physician had a responsibility to warn her that she was at risk for this cancer. Now, other states have ruled differently. They've said that, yeah, you know, it's the responsibility of the patient to tell his family members that they're at risk if they choose to do so. Um, it'll evolve, but it's going to become important for you to know what your responsibility is to report this information to other people. And I hope you're involved in that debate because it really does kind of strike at the heart. Like I said, most of us are carriers for something or we're at genetic risk for something. We might not know what it is yet, but as this explodes um, and as we're better able to find genes responsible for disease or risk for disease, um, you're gonna need to be on your toes with it. Uh, financial implications in equity and healthcare. Ugh, hate any discussion of finances in nursing, but they are necessary and important. So there are industries that are involved in genetic testing where there's a dollar to be made, somebody's making it, trust me. They may be developing therapeutics based on genomic research. They are entitled under the law to patent their product and charge whatever they want for their work. That's, you know, that's how it's it, That's how it works in America. In the past, companies have actually tried to patent genes, human genes, naturally occurring genes and gene sequences because they found them first. But in 2013, the Supreme Court stated that no one can patent pieces of DNA in its natural, unmodified form. Now, if you edit that DNA, if you modify it in any way, then you can patent it. That's yours. You did it first. But DNA, it's sort of like patenting water or air. It's a natural thing. How, how does anyone own it? Um, so that has happened. Anyway, all of this has increased the cost for genomic medicine, for genomic testing, and that leads to inequitable distribution. And I know that in my line of work, I'm a labor and delivery nurse. We deal with a lot of patients who have had genetic testing. They will tell you that they were charged $400 for this NIPS testing not told that their insurance wouldn't cover it. Um, can you afford $400 when you're also trying to buy diapers and juice? Well, if you're lucky enough to do that, sure. $400 doesn't seem like a lot to know whether your child is healthy and to have options. They're not. Um, but if you don't have $400 to pay your rent and they're shutting your water off, now you have an inequity. If this is a beneficial thing that we want people to have, we need to have access to everyone or else we are at risk for increasing disparities in healthcare in a country that's already plagued with systemic racism, implicit bias, and other injustices. Just tuck that away and someday get on your soapbox about it. Our last topic is environmental, global, and intergenerational justice. We're almost there. Um, and I'm gonna use a case to sort of illustrate these concepts. So. As humans are getting bigger, they're growing up into their scientific knowledge, they're modifying the environment with genomic research. Somebody with wisdom, who's not just advanced scientifically, but has a strong ethical foundation and the ability to predict these changes, the impact of these changes, needs to be in this conversation. We need to consider the impact that all of this work will have on the environment and future generations. You know, really, things that we decide today, think of the things that were decided for us 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and we're dealing with the fallout from all of those decisions. Some good, some bad. Um, when we modify our food, our crops, 
and other species that might have effects on the environment that have unintended consequences. So editing germline cells in particular, eggs and sperm and embryos, early embryos, that has a direct impact on future generations. If you don't know that what you're doing is going to help, you have to think about that person seven generations from now who's dealing with the fallout. And that's why there's been a call by many bioethicists and many researchers to pause development of any projects that deal with human embryonic cells. So consider the dilemma of addressing malaria on the African content. Just a basic primer, mosquitoes carry malaria. It's a vector. Malaria kills one child in Africa every 75 seconds. Imagine how many kids have already died just while I've been talking to make this one single video. Hundreds. Killing mosquitoes reduces the burden of disease. So fewer mosquitoes equals less malaria, and that's a good thing. We like that. <clears throat> DDT kills mosquitoes. It's very effective, and it's very cheap. But DDT alters the human genome in both somatic and germline cells. I can include references if you ask me for them. Otherwise, it's a lot of work. It also also alters DNA in many other species. And some of the more vulnerable species would be like frogs, birds, fish. Some of these species are species that people rely on for food. Some of them do things for the biosphere or the ecosystem that we don't even know. And DDT causes changes in both somatic and germline cells, increased incidence of cancers, increased incidence of um, birth defects. So the World Health Organization calls for controlled application of DDT in countries where malaria is common because the burden of disease for malaria is more than the burden that DDT could impose. DDT is also like four times cheaper than the other leading agent that could control the mosquito population. And in parts of the developing world, that money could be spent battling HIV. It could be battled uh, fighting food insecurity. It could be battled. I mean, it could be used. Sorry if I misspoke. It could be used in many other ways to benefit the population, right? So the WHO is saying DDT is our fastest fix right now. Not that we like it, but we might have to use it because malaria is so deadly. Even the people who don't die from it get very, very sick. So there is now a research project using CRISPR technology to genetically alter mosquitoes so that they become infertile. It's male mosquitoes. And when they mate with female mosquitoes, those female mosquitoes become infertile. And when those females try to mate with other males, those males become infertile. It's a really wild technology. Some critics are saying that there's potential to eradicate the entire mosquito population. Hmm. Wow, eradicating an entire species? Well, people who talked about gen designer babies, which we are years away from, talk about playing God. Eradicating a species sounds kind of like that to me. <clears throat> and there might be environmental impacts. Mosquitoes carry malaria. Yeah, that's true. But they also pollinate plants and they serve as a food source for other organisms. So this isn't a simple, simple issue. We've got changes to the genome caused by DDT. We've got change, you know, significant health burden from malaria. We've got a chemical that can fight malaria, but, you know, it's not ideal. We have another chemical that can fight it, but it's less effective or another one that's a little more expensive. Mosquito nets have not been as effective as they hoped. So what do we do? Let's examine it through the lens of the mercy values and the critical concerns. It is mercy week and we're almost done anyway, so let's go. We have a duty to the earth and a call to nonviolence. We need to act with integrity and fight for social justice. I'm sure you've heard these terms thrown around before. I certainly have, and I've only been here like about a month. We have some choices in this scenario. <clears throat> if we were to advocate for one, I mean, nobody's really asking us, but someday they might ask you, so you could look for other pesticides with lower risks to humans and to the environment, and you could offer them and subsidize the cost. The more wealthy nations could pay for this treatment in Africa, right? 
That's one solution. You could use DDT and try to be very judicious about it to control malaria and find ways to mitigate the genetic risk to humans and other species and, and minimize the risk to the environment. That takes a whole lot of science. And in the meantime, you're releasing a chemical that is known to be harmful. We could eradicate mosquitoes with CRISPR and hope that other insects will assume their place in the biosystem, right? Or in the ecosystem, rather. Yeah, that's a choice too. I mean, if you're killing them with DDT, what's the difference between killing them with DDT and killing them with this infertility gene? Um, but eradicating a species is not something that I think humans ought to be doing lightly. Um, or you could research ways to use gene editing to make people less susceptible to malaria, maybe give them a copy of the sickle cell trait and leave them one normal gene um, so that everybody has basically sickle cell trait and they get less sick. That's years away from development. In the meantime, kids have died. Just in the last slide, we probably lost six or seven kids, right? 75 seconds. No right or wrong answers, or maybe there are answers that are more right, answers that are less wrong, but that is something for you to consider. And with that, I am going to sign off and post all your videos.